Hello class, uh, welcome to your second video on ancient Egyptian mythology, wherein we cover the history of Egyptian mythology, the history of Egyptology, the core themes of Egyptian myth, Afrocentrist interpretation of Egyptian myth and religion, the secret name of Isis, and just for good measure, the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten's early axial age transformation of Egyptian myth and religion, the goddess Maat, beautiful Egyptian poetry, and the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Uh, filling out the threefold approach, which is the only one you really need to know of early, middle, and late, uh, the textbook helpfully breaks uh, down the history of Egypt into a few more intermediary stages, and also distinguishes major differences in regards to mythological religion in some of the main urban centers. It included uh, chapters from Gerald Pinch's Egyptian Myth, a very short introduction, and at the outset, uh, Pinch comments helpfully on the diversity of Egyptian myth, writing, Egyptian mythology never solidified into one standard version. It continued to change and develop over 3,000 years. The chief deities of regional temples generated their own myths. The basic events, which might be described as the core myths, were constantly retold and given many different actors and settings. I've also included these uh, boxes with core myths and major deities in the slides. Notice that in some versions of Egyptian myth, the creator or Atum Ra comes into being within the noon or primordial ocean, whereas in others, as we mentioned last week, the male creator god is self-generating. It seems that from a quite uh, early period in the Old Kingdom, goddesses were defined in terms of their relationships with male deities, and maternal love plays a major role in many Egyptian myths concerning goddesses. Pinch notes that the restrictions on religious art can make goddesses look misleadingly passive in Egyptian myth. So iconographically, Isis is often depicted as a wife, mourning her husband, standing deferentially beside him, and sweetly nursing her baby child. When you look more closely at the myths, you see she's an extremely dominant figure who fights for vengeance and plots political intrigues to place her son on the throne of Egypt. Also, goddesses in art seem to have a wider range of physical forms than most gods, and they shapeshift a lot. In one mythical episode, Isis changes from an old crone to a young girl to a bird of prey. Egyptian deities were not understood to be all-powerful. They had birth, sometimes death, and were expected to obey the rules of Maat, the goddess of cosmic justice, harmony, and order. Majority of temple inscriptions, Egyptian deities seem to be gracious and generous beings responding to prayers and offerings, giving their blessings. But incantational spells of protection from certain beings revealed that they are not all sweetness and light. The sevenfold form of the lion goddess Sekhmet was greatly feared. Like in Greek myth, Egyptian deities could often be portrayed with human failings such as jealousy, lust, and bad temper. By the end of the 4th century CE, there were very few people left who could understand Egyptian hieroglyphic script. During this time, an Egyptian magus, Hor Apollo, got the book here, wrote an esoteric manuscript on specific Egyptian hieroglyphs. In the Hellenistic context, uh, this book, along with Plutarch's on the mysteries of Isis and Osiris, would become probably the two core texts for the knowledge of Egyptian myth and religion until well into the Renaissance. The reason for the Renaissance revival of interest in Egyptology was basically that many other texts which were coming back into circulation spoke very highly of Egyptian culture, civilization, religion, art, poetry, and philosophy. The Corpus Hermeticum became available in Europe in translation at around this time. It reflects the cosmopolitan world of Hellenized and Romanized Egyptian culture. Although it was taken to be older than Pythagoras, Plato, Aristotle, and even the Bible by Renaissance scholars such as Pico and Ficino, by the 17th century CE, scholarship had proved that the Hermetica was not, in fact, immeasurably ancient. Around this time, secret societies such as the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons used Egyptian symbolism to lend a spurious antiquity to their beliefs and practices. This is also the Enlightenment context for the emergence of the modern usage of the term Illuminati. Egyptian wisdom became associated with radical anti-establishment groups such as the leaders of the French Revolution and the Founding Fathers of America. Which is why you see so much obsession with Egyptian symbolism, obelisks, and pyramids in the founding documents of the American and the French revolutions. In light of diverse new material evidence from archaeology, Egyptian hieroglyphs were not actually deciphered until the early 19th century. 
and it wasn't until the late 19th century that a huge number of Egyptian texts were translated into European languages for the first time. That would be all these books and more, uh, which were edited and released for popular consumption by E.A. Wallace Budge, and which you can still find very uh, cheaply available. Books such as The God of the Egyptians, and especially The Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is a really fun, inexpensive text to own, because in uh, Budge's style of translation, he includes the Egyptian hieroglyphs along with a transliteration of how they would have sounded in ancient Egyptian, along with a word-by-word -word translation. Uh, with this newfound, very wide availability of Egyptian sources in translation, mystical and occult sects such as the Theosophical Society, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, added idiosyncratic interpretations of Egyptian religion and magic to their hodgepodge of beliefs. And this probably accounts for why the discipline of Egyptology in the early to mid 20th century became so intensely conservative. Uh, more contemporary Egyptologists have strived to treat Egyptian religion in a non-judgmental way. It's also interesting that Pinch remarks how nowadays there are fewer Egyptologists who specialize in myth and religion. The few who really do are superlatively excellent, however, like Pinch and also Jan Asman, who we'll learn about more in a minute. I'm including in our unit on Egyptian myth and religion this semester, um, some chapters from Molefi Kete Asant's book called The Egyptian Philosophers. Um, to begin here, just a few words from Asant about what he means by Afrocentric education. The narratives of our lives were not our narratives. They were the narratives of Europeans. They were the narratives of white people. We participated in those narratives because our own narratives have been basically destroyed, decentered, dislocated, confused. And so consequently, the effect of this is confusion for the African population. Uh, not only confusion for the African population, but after 1865, there were no people who came together and said, okay, uh, perhaps black people, the four million Africans who are freed, maybe there should be uh, some process by which we uh, look at uh, what has happened, a debriefing of the 246 years, some uh, uh, possible way of examining what has happened to African people uh, in terms of culture, in terms of uh, history, in terms of psychology, in terms of spirituality. Uh, what, what, what's been the result of 246 years of this dislocation? talk about a conversation starter. Assant is not an Egyptologist. His book is written for a popular audience. It's also not a book about the material conditions of Egypt, but an attempt to concentrate on the intellectual and ethical gifts of Egyptian society. In Assant, what we get is a very philosophical reading of Egyptian myth and religion. The most central concept in Assant's reading is about the goddess Maat, the goddess of order, balance, and harmony and Mach and ethics. Assant's reading of Egyptian philosophy on the basis of predominantly mythological and religious sources is pretty daring. Specifically on myth, Assant writes, civilization may be said to exist where a group of people or groups of people share the same fundamental myths, even though they may have different names for the experience. What allows Assant to read Egyptian myth and religion as philosophy is his idea of the first beginning or first occasion. We should be fairly familiar with this idea by now from studying the cosmogonies of other um, ancient peoples. What Assant is basically saying here is that myth, specifically genealogical myth regarding the origin of the world and the gods, represents a divine model for ordinary humans. The systematic structure of a people's myth can be seen as a kind of constitution, like the Holy Scriptures, the Quran, the Torah. While we could we read Western philosophy as separating from its mythical origins to some extent, it also has extensive myths about its first beginnings. In this way, myth and the religion which flows from myth provides us with both a philosophy and a philosophy of history, as well as a metaphysics, an ethics, even an aesthetics. Sant, the first occasion in the Egyptian context is the realm of divinities. So all the core Egyptian myths uh, richly developed that we learned about from Pinch uh, would be the events that occur in the first occasion. Asant writes, As the Egyptians saw it when God emerged from noon to create the universe and all things in it, including the various other appellations for the dimension and characteristics of the divine, this was the initiating of the first occasion. 
During the first occasion, divinities interact with each other and in their relationships establish patterns and behaviors uh, that constantly reappear in the mundane world. In the end, the conquest of good or mat over evil or isfet involves many instances of conflict, both in the first occasion and in ordinary human time. Asant defines the process of connecting to the first occasion as mat, and he understands myths about Ra or Atom Ra, created the universe, including all things, and dying each day as the sun enters into the ocean only to be reborn from the Duat or underworld the next day. Asant makes some pretty interesting comments on mythic unity in Egyptian thought. Past, present, future are not strictly separable. Sometimes we are closer to the ancestors and at other times closer to posterity. Even the community of the dead is one with the community of the living. The teachings or lesson of Egyptian myth is that human agency can reconstruct the world as it was before the crisis of Maat or ethics and the killing of Osiris by Seth. Asant discusses core Egyptian philosophical, religious, and mythological concepts as tending towards stability, wellness, and eternity. The use of the word Kemet in Asant's book means land of the blacks. Asant asks poignantly, can white supremacy ever end without the truth? Where the truth for Asant and the purpose of his book is to prove that many of the hallmarks of civilization deriving from myth and religion as well as philosophy were in fact developed for the first times by Africans in Africa. It takes a second to get used to Assant's um, spelling or transliteration of some of the Egyptian deities in his writing. In his account of the Ennead cosmogony at Heliopolis, he writes, Atum Kepri, or the sun god slash becoming the beetle, spits out Shu, air, spits out Tefnut, moisture, spits out Geb, earth, spits out Nun, the sky, these are the four celestial powers, but soon the creation of terrestrial powers ensues and Osar, that is Osiris, Oset, that is Isis, Set, or Seth, and Nebhet, or Nephthys, are brought into existence. This generation of deities more ritually close to humans are never separate from Atum or Ra. So Asant provides a philosophical interpretation of the Ennead myth according to which the great eight plus Atum, order all becoming. As the Heliopolans sought, Atum created the universe by self-coagulation, by his semen or the projection of his heart. The male seed becomes a stipic impulse, a catalyst which causes the first primordial hill. As the Memphites sought, however, Ptah created the universe through the spoken word. He opened his mouth and spoke, and the universe came into being. There is nothing that was created that was not created by Ptah. Asant also discusses the Ogdoad. These are the mother fathers of Ra who bring the divine into existence. Like the child who emerges from the primordial lotus, the principle of life itself is Ra. We will return to Asant in a moment, but first let us pivot to a Middle Kingdom text that helps us round out the story of Isis just a bit beyond Plutarch. This text is called The Secret Name of Ra or Legend of Ra and Isis and has been found in several sources and was first deciphered in 1883. I first encountered this myth in a Wallace Budge book. Although it is technically a myth about a spell that alleviates snakebite, it is revealing about the mythic relationship between the goddess Isis and Ra, the sun god. There are two main versions with slight uh, differences in the plot. We'll be focusing on the later version. Although for those interested in earlier forms of Isis worship, and in the earlier Egyptian goddess Sekhmet and Hathor. I've also included a, a slide on the earlier version at the end. When I was prepping for the course and found this wonderful storyteller version of the secret name of Ra, as well as the Eye of Ra or Eye of the Sun, I couldn't for the life of me discover where these excellent versions came from. Does anyone out there recognize what book this is to be found in? In the storyteller's version, after some preliminary exalting of Ra's various roles in myth and religion, we read, To know the secret name of Ra is to have power over him and the world that he created. Budge translates as, His names are manifold and unknown, and the gods even know them not. It's interesting that the secret name of a male ruler god comes up in other traditions as well. In Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, the mystical strains of those religions in particular. 
and we're going to encounter another moment of the idea of God's secret name in the Lilith myth. So it's pretty fascinating that in a Middle Kingdom Egyptian text, that is between 2000 and 1600 BCE, find world history's first mythological reference to God's secret name. And no less interesting is that the goddess Isis comes to learn Ra's secret name through trickery involving a serpent. The storyteller writes, Isis longed for power. She had dreamed that one day she would have a marvelous falcon-headed son called Horus, and she wanted the throne of Ra to give her a child. Isis was the mistress of magic, wiser than millions of men, but she knew that nothing in creation was powerful enough to harm its creator. Her only chance was to turn the power of Ra against himself. And at last, Isis thought of a cruel and cunning plan. So remember how in the Huluputri tale, Inanya went from being a woman in fear of the sky god An, in fear of the storm god Enlil, to becoming the goddess of heaven and earth. Here in this tale, Isis becomes the only female deity to know Ra's secret. The description of the aging of the gods and Ra as an old man is also pretty wonderful. The storyteller writes, Every day the sun god walked through his kingdom, attended by a crowd of spirits and lesser deities. But Ra was growing old, his eyes were dim, his steps no longer firm, and he had even begun to drivel. Budge translates, Now the divine one had grown old, he dribbled at his mouth, his spittle fell on the earth, and his slobbering dropped upon the ground. Isis kneads the spittle of Ra with earth and forms a sacred serpent. And she performs an incantation to give the serpent life. And the serpent ends up biting Ra at the crossroads of his daily journey. Ra is inundated with the serpent's poison and gives out a great cry throughout all of creation. At this point, the storyteller does something somewhat ingenious. Whereas the Wallace Budge version, based on the original Egyptian text, merely speaks of Ra's company of the gods, the storyteller for the beginner audience mentions all the specific deities to who Ra might have cried out. Ra summons the whole company of the gods, or all these deities, and probably more, but it is only Isis who can help drive the poison from Ra's body on his deathbed. Ra says to Isis, Now I am colder than water and hotter than fire. My eyes darken, I cannot see the sky, and my body is soaked with the sweat of fever. The cunning of Isis here is masterful. Tell us who you really are, Isis says. Tell us your full name. Ra evades a bit by giving the litany of all his more commonly known or exoteric identities. Isis replies, we know all that. If I am to find a spell to drive out this poison, I will have to use your secret name. Say your name and live. Ra's pain mounts to a crescendo, and he orders the other gods to stand back while he whispers his secret name to Isis, saying, Now the power of the secret name has passed from my heart into your heart. In time, you can give it to your son, but warn him never to betray the secret. Notice this myth accounts for why Isis's son Horus will end up with the most privileged position within Egyptian mythology as a whole. Having accomplished her plan by trickery, Isis nods and begins to chant a great spell that drives the poison from the limbs of Ra. The sun god returns to his boat of the million of years, that is, his daily cycle of birth, passage through the heavens, death and renewal. And Isis shouts for joy at the success of her plan. She knew that one day Horus, her son, would sit on the throne of Egypt and wield the power of Ra. In fact, the end of the Badge version is even more magisterial than the storyteller's adaptation. Ra says, I consent that Isis shall search into me and my name shall pass from me to her. Isis says to her own son Horus, the god hath bound himself by oath to deliver up his two eyes, the sun and the moon. Thus was the name of the great god taken from him and Isis, the lady of words of magical power, said, Depart, poison, go forth from Ra. Let the poison die, and let Ra live. These are the words of Isis, the mighty lady, the mistress of the god, who knew Ra by his name. Although there are fewer contemporary Egyptologists working in the area of Egyptian myth and religion, the work of 20th century Egyptology as a whole, in providing for the first time 
the complete scriptural canons of ancient Egypt has resulted in enormously easy access for the common reader to a wide variety of translations. Gerald Pinch or Jan Osman are great places to start for further investigation into Egyptology, but they still write predominantly as scholars. The New Age co-optation of Egyptian myth and religion that began with Blavatsky's Isis Unveiled book in the late 19th century certainly had some less than ideal impacts on the later history of 20th century Egyptology, but the New Age interest in Isis has resulted in the last few decades in a flowering of excellent books on the goddess Isis and other Egyptian goddesses such as Hathor, Sekhmet, and Bastet. I would recommend as probably the best books in this area, at once highly readable, very scholarly, and very animated by fundamental questions posed to us by the Egyptian sources would be these three books by Leslie Jackson. And anyone still looking for a presentation topic or interested in jumping ship from their existing topic to a new topic, any one of these um, three books would make an excellent uh, subject for a presentation. Finally, uh, scholars often consider Isis as a goddess who rises to prominence over and against earlier forms of the mother goddess in Egypt, such as Sekhmet and Hathor. Found in the tomb of the actual Tutankhamun in the New Kingdom, but thought to be written down during the Middle Kingdom, if not earlier, the Book of the Heavenly Cow features a flood myth similar to the Atrahasis tale, but involving the goddess Hathor. Hathor is initially described as the Eye of Ra, an extension of himself. When Ra finds out that humans are plotting against him, he sends her out on a murderous rampage, but then Ra changes his mind. Seeing that Hathor is intent on carrying out the annihilation of the human species, he orders a red mineral to be added to 7,000 jars of beer. He floods the fields around Hathor. Hathor wakes from a sleep, sees her reflection in the pools of blood, drinks with delight in her heart, and fails to notice that humanity has survived her murderous rampage. Ra welcomes her back from that day on, and alcohol is drunk during festivals of Hathor. Hathor can also be understood as the goddess of love, similar to Inanya or Ishtar or Aphrodite. And this particular myth is sometimes understood as the transformation wherein an earlier Sekhmet goddess becomes Hathor. Feared warrior goddess Sekhmet becomes the goddess of fertility, love, and the arts. So I've included a few more sources as well as chapters from Assant's book in order to round out our study of Egyptian myth and religion. Akhenaton was an approximately 15th century BCE pharaoh and mythic revolutionary, arguably the world's first monotheist. The Egyptian poetry that has survived is exceptionally beautiful and gives us a really profound insight into the worldview and mythological world picture of the Egyptians. Probably most uh, famous among all surviving Egyptian poems is the Harper's Song for Inherhaki. And also, no study of a world mythology course would be complete without taking a look at fragments or parts of the Egyptian Book of the Dead or Papyrus of Ani, and specifically the role that the goddess Maat plays in the underworld or the Duat. You can learn a lot more about Akhenaten from the slides, as well as Assant's chapter on Akhenaten. I've also included for the modules in this week a video by the famous Egyptologist Jan Asman on Akhenaten's legacy, Osman being the world's leading scholar on this particular pharaoh, most famous for arguing that it is Akhenatian monotheism or henotheism which introduces Moses to the idea before the exodus from Egypt. It's also really fascinating that we do have a surviving poem in ancient Egyptian that expresses Akhenaten's new mythological idea. This poem is known as the Great Hymn to the Aten. Here you see Assant's translation. I first encountered the Akhenaten poem in the Norton Anthology of World Poetry, and have also included that translation in the course pack. It is in free verse and much less literal than most translations of the Akhenaten hymn, but I still find it stunningly beautiful in its evocation of the Egyptian religious attitude. There's more on this in the slide, but Assant's overall reading of the Aten in the Akhenaten hymn focuses on the translation of Aten by the word disc and goes back to the Old Kingdom. During the Old Kingdom, the word was used to denote a circular object such as a mirror, cult object, or ball. It might have acquired the meaning of the day's disc, meaning the sun in the sky. 
So when Akhenaten took Aten to be the sole deity, he was in effect raising a common deity to a royal and consequently universal level. Here you see uh, three of Jan Asman's more widely read books on Akhenaten, Moses, and monotheism. I find the Perlman free verse translation to be pretty magical. If Akhenaten did represent a quantum leap in mythical consciousness or the unity of the Aten, as both Asman and Asan argued, then perhaps the Perlman translation um, is so unusual precisely because it attempts to capture that historical moment. The Harper's Song for In Her Haki is a very famous example of tomb poetry and dates to around 1160 BC, that is in the New Kingdom. You'll notice a fascinating parallel of mythological and ethical images between Siduri's wisdom to Gilgamesh and the song to Inhernaki. Siduri had said, you recall, enjoy this life each day. It is a gift. Don't set your sight on otherworldly hopes. Importantly, Egypt's rich legacy of lyric and funerary poetry are full of such carpe diem or Latin seize the day moments. Asant quotes an example from the Middle Kingdom that he attributes to the wisdom of Imhotep. Imhotep's wisdom is clearly one of the models behind the Harper song. Finally, for students interested in Egyptian conceptions of the soul and the afterlife, there's no better place to start than the Papyrus of Ani or the Egyptian Book of the Dead. The Wallace Budge edition with transliterated um, Egyptian as well as hieroglyphs is widely available and very cheap. But probably the funnest one to have is this, the illustrated ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead. According to Asant, the ideal of Maat underpins the divine world order as a whole, and thus Maat's ethical and practical orientations for human life are a way for us to experience integration with, as well as separation from, what he calls the first occasion or mythic beginning. Though the world may seem cruel, oppressive, disloyal, full of betrayal and sadness, it is nevertheless watched over by Ma'at from a place of equanimity. It thus makes sense that the Egyptians primarily encounter Ma'at, cosmic justice or truth, as the final culminating moment of their journey through the Duat, or the Egyptian underworld. The soul, or Ba, represented by a small bird, is placed on the scales against the feather of truth in the, in the presence of Ma'at. And passing this test, one soul weighing less than the feather of truth is the key to becoming another Osiris. Such a hero or heroine's journey requires one to live in accordance with all of the Egyptian virtues, according to Asant, which include criticality, devotion, control, discipline, tolerance, forbearance, steadfastness, faith, spiritual desire, initiation, and more. The text itself of the Papyrus of Ani dates to around 1250 BCE. Passages from the Papyrus of Ani go back to the pyramid texts, the earliest surviving strata of Egyptian myth and religion, and many passages derive from the coffin texts or texts from the middle period. So you can see in the uh, background of the Papyrus of Ani or Egyptian Book of the Dead, a process of increasing democratization of Egyptian religion. Of the core religious myths about the afterlife that you find in the Egyptian Book of the Dead as well as elsewhere have to do with a fundamentally three-part soul involving the Ba, the soul itself, represented by a small bird, the Ka, the spirit, or the double, or the shadow, as well as the Ankh, representing the effective or eternal being of the self. The papyrus of Ani is thus described as the work of the Ankh makers, that is, people who are able to unify the Ba and the Ka in order to produce the Ankh and thus immortal life. Most of the Book of the Dead involves passages so that the mortal soul can safely navigate and traverse the various stages of descent into the Duat. And there are many dangers for the soul in the underworld. Eventually, the soul is able to integrate its Ba and Ka, now free as an Ankh coming and going each day like Ra and haunting in the Egyptian conception the marshes and the fields of rushes, the constellations of the north and south. The greatest trial in the Duat is the weighing of the heart against the feather of Maat. And in order to successfully achieve this, the soul has to undergo a process of negative confession, basically lying in the presence of the gods. I have not done this, I have not done that. But it's not strictly lying, for, for in a way the pure soul forgets all its sins. The verdict is recorded by Thoth, the scribal god, or in Plutarch, Hermes. And the soul, the truth of voice or proper truth, is represented by Horus. 
If the soul passes this test, it lives forever. And if it fails, it gets thrown to the lion, crocodile, hippopotamus monster, Amit, to be devoured, to become nothing, and thus to be destroyed for all eternity. There is no eternal punishment in the duat, but simply the hope of eternal salvation. And this is why possession of a papyrus scroll of Annie and the memorization of each particular spell during the journey through the duat would have been common knowledge to many Egyptians. Here you see more scenes from the papyrus of Ani in the underworld on the right, Osiris, Isis, and Nephthys behind him, and the hawk god Horus leading a soul into the divine presence. The miraculously ornate jewelry that have been discovered in many of the tombs of the pharaohs and other Egyptian archaeological sites truly baffles the imagination in terms of the craftsmanship and the beauty. If you ever get to travel to the world's museums, many have excellent collections of Egyptian artifacts, especially in Berlin, New York, St. Petersburg, and Paris. Maybe remember this course for that day and download some of these uh, PowerPoints for your use then. Okay, so that's a wrap. Um, thank you everybody for listening, and I'll see you next week.